Join us as we delve into the chilling case of Dean Arnold Coral, also known as the Candy Man. This notorious serial killer terrorized Houston, Texas during the early 1970s, with his brutal crimes remaining one of the most shocking and disturbing cases in American history. From his childhood and upbringing to his killing spree and final end, we'll explore the twisted mind of this predator and the tragic stories of his victims. Get ready for a journey into the dark, as we reveal the horror of Dean Arnold Coral. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Coral was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana, on December 24, 1939. He was the first child of Arnold Edwin Coral and Mary Robinson. Coral's parents had frequent arguments and they divorced when he was seven. That same year, he was diagnosed with rheumatic fever and had to renounce physical education. The combined effect of growing up in a broken home with medical difficulties made him a shy boy who rarely socialized with other children, though he still cared for the well-being and feelings of others. In 1950, Carl's parents attempted reconciliation and even married again, but they divorced for a second time three years later. Carl's mother, who had retained custody over Carl and his younger brother Stanley, remarried to a traveling clock salesman named Jake West and had a third child with him. The family later settled in Vidor, Texas where they opened a candy-making business named Pecan Price. While they were in high school, Carl and Stanley ran the candy-making machine and packed the product while West sold it. The working hours did not bother Carl, who was noted to be a well-behaved student with satisfactory grades. However, he continued to be regarded as a loner by his peers, although he would date girls occasionally. Following Carl's graduation in the summer of 1958, the family moved to Houston, where they sold most of their products, and they opened their own pecan price shop. Two years later, Carl obeyed his mother's request to return to Indiana and live with his widowed grandmother. There, he dated a local girl, at some point, she proposed to him, but he turned her down. The West Robinson marriage began to face difficulties in 1962. Carl returned to Houston to help them, but in 1963, the marriage fell apart and they divorced. Robinson opened her own candy business and made Carl vice president. That same year, one of Robinson's teenage male employees complained about Carl making sexual advances towards him but she simply fired the boy. A year later, Carl was drafted into the U.S. Army and was assigned to Fort Polk, Louisiana, for a 10-month training regime. There, Carl realized that he was homosexual, and he had his first sexual relations. After being honorably discharged, he returned to work in his mother's company and made advances towards male employees. In 1967, Carl met 12-year-old David Owen Brooks, and the two became close friends. They would go on trips together, and Brooks admired Carl to the point of considering him a substitute father. However, the relationship took a darker turn beginning in 1969, when Carl paid Brooks to perform oral sex on him. After the closure of the candy company, Carl got another job testing electrical relay systems at the Houston Lighting and Power Company. Carl's first known murder victim was Jeffrey Conan, a student at the University of Texas in Austin, whom he abducted while hitchhiking on September 25, 1970. Conan's body was later buried in High Island Beach. Around the time of Conan's murder, Brooks interrupted Carl in the act of raping two teenage boys, whom he strapped to a torture board. Carl promised Brooks a car in return for his silence and he accepted the offer. Shortly after murdering the boys, Carl bought Brooks a green Chevrolet Corvette. Later, Carl offered $200 to Brooks for any boy he could lure to Carl's apartment. On December 13, Brooks lured two boys away from a religious rally, and Carl raped and killed them. On January 30, 1971, Carl and Brooks encountered two boys walking home. The boys were lured to Carl's van and driven to his apartment, where they were raped and killed. Their bodies were then buried in a boat shed he owned. Between March and May, Carl abducted and killed three more victims with Brooks' help. On August 17th, Carl and Brooks encountered an acquaintance of Brooks, named Reuben Haney, walking home from a movie theater. Carl subsequently took Haney to his home and strangled him to death. In the winter of 1971, Brooks lured Elmer Wayne Henley as a new victim. For reasons unknown, Carl spared him, 
offered Henley the same fee of $200 for any boy he could lure to Carl's apartment, and told Henley that he was a member of a slavery ring. Henley ignored Carl's offer for several months, but he finally accepted it in early 1972, when Henley's family were in dire financial circumstances. On March 24, 1972, the trio encountered an acquaintance of Henley's, Frank Aguirre, when he was leaving a restaurant. They convinced Aguirre to come to Carl's apartment with the promise of drinking beer and smoking marijuana. There, Carl pushed him onto the table and handcuffed him. When he saw it, Henley attempted to persuade Carl to not hurt Aguirre, instead, he killed him, then revealed that there was no human slavery ring and that he had also raped and murdered the previous boy that Henley had lured for him. Henley then followed Carl's instructions and buried Aguirre's body in High Island Beach. However, according to Brooks, Henley was a sadistic individual who enjoyed murdering boys on his own. The murder spree continued until August 7, 1973. Henley, now aged 17, invited Timothy Curley to attend a party at Carl's house. Curley accepted the offer, but as they were heading there, they were joined by Rhonda Williams, a friend of Curley's. Williams' father was drunk and he attacked her that evening, so she decided to wait outside until he sobered up. Henley took pity of Williams and invited her to Carl's home. Carl was initially furious about Henley bringing a girl to his house, but later calmed down after Henley told him about Williams' father and how she could not return home, and he offered the trio beer and marijuana. They drank in smoke while Carl watched and waited for them to pass out. Henley awoke to find himself gagged while Carl snapped handcuffs onto his wrists, the still unconscious Williams and Curly were strapped next to him in the same manner. Noticing that Henley was awake, Carl removed the gag and said that he was going to kill them all because of Williams. Henley then promised to Carl that he would participate in the torture and murder of both Curly and Williams if Carl released him, to which he agreed. The two dragged Curly and Williams to Carl's bedroom and strapped them to the board. Carl handed Henley a hunting knife and told him to cut Williams' clothes, insisting that he rape and kill Williams entirely by himself, while he was occupied with Curly. By this point, both Curly and Williams had awoken. Henley removed Williams' gag and began to cut her clothes, prompting her to ask, is this for real? When Henley said yes, Williams asked him, are you going to do anything about it? This caused Henley to question his actions under Carl's orders for the first time. He first asked Carl if he could take Williams to another room, but he ignored him. Henley then grabbed Carl's pistol and shouted that they had gone too far and they had to stop. Carl left Curly and yelled at Henley to kill him. Panicking, Henley stepped back as Carl advanced and taunted him, saying, you won't do it. Henley then fired once at Carl, hitting him in the forehead, but the bullet failed to penetrate his skull. Carl continued to lurch towards Henley and he fired two more shots, hitting Carl in the left shoulder. Carl then spun around and exited the room, hitting the wall of the hallway. Henley followed him and fired three more times into his back, killing him. Henley freed Curly and Williams and they discussed what to do. Henley just wanted to leave, but Curly convinced him to call the police and explain what happened. Once in custody, Henley confessed to Brooks and his own involvement in Carl's murders and revealed the locations where the bodies had been buried. The police used unqualified convict labor to dig up the bodies, and the search was abruptly ended when their body count just surpassed 25, the number of victims attributed to Juan Corona, who was considered the most prolific American serial killer up to that point. As a result, the total number of Carl's victims remains unknown, and some of his attributed 29 victims were known only from spare bones that did not match any retrieved bodies. Henley was later indicted for and found guilty of six murders. Brooks, who attempted to portray himself as a silent partner of Carl and Henley's who was not present for any rapes and murders, was indicted for four murders and found guilty of one. Both accomplices were sentenced to life in prison. Modus operandi Carl targeted males between the ages of 13 and 20, all of whom he would abduct with the help of Brooks and Henley. His victims were either friends of Henley and or Brooks, acquainted with Carl, or former employees of the Carl Candy Company. Carl would drive them to his house with promises of alcohol or drugs, and once there, they would be stripped naked and tied to a plywood torture board in Carl's bedroom. 
They were then raped, beaten, and tortured through various means, including rape, sodomy, plucking out their pubic hairs, chewing on their genitals, inserting various objects into their rectums, and putting glass rods in their urethras and smashing them, sometimes for several days. When he killed his victims, Carl would usually strangle them or shoot them with a .22 caliber pistol. However, in the case of Jeffrey Conan, he was asphyxiated with a piece of cloth. The bodies were then tied in plastic sheets and buried in one of three mass graves, beneath Carl's boat shed in southwest Houston, near Lake Sam Rayburn, and in High Island Beach. Occasionally, Carl would force his victims to either call or write letters to their parents explaining their absence, helping the Houston Police Department's assumption that the victims were runaways. He also kept their keys as trophies. Known Victims Early 1969, David Owen Brooks, 14, his first accomplice, paid for oral sodomy. 1970 September 25, Jeffrey Conan, 18, strangled and asphyxiated with a cloth gag, buried at High Island Beach. December 13, James Glass and Danny Yates, both raped, strangled with a cord and buried in the boat shed. James Glass, 14. Danny Yates, 14. 1971. January 30th, Donald Waldrop and his brother Jerry, both raped, tortured, strangled, and buried in the boat shed. Donald Waldrop, 15. Jerry Waldrop, 14. Between January 30th and March 9th, Elmer Wayne Henley, 14, his second accomplice, attempted, was spared and recruited into the crimes. March 9th, Randall Harvey, 15, raped, shot in the head, and buried in the boat shed, identified in 2008. May 29th, David Hillegiest and Gregory Winkle, both raped, strangled with a cord, and buried in the boat shed. David Hillegiest, 13. Gregory Malley Winkle, 16. August 17th, Reuben Watson Haney, 17, raped, strangled, and buried in the boat shed. Unspecified date in 1971 or 1972, swimsuit boy, 15 to 19, unidentified, buried in the boat shed, his body was found on August 9, 1973. 1972. February 9th, William Branch, Jr. 17, emasculated, strangled, and buried in the boat shed, identified in 1985. March 24, Frank Aguirre, 18, Henley's friend and William's fiancé, strangled and buried at High Island Beach. April 20th, Mark Scott, 17, strangled and buried at High Island, his body was not recovered. May 21st, Johnny DeLone and Billy Balch, Jr., both raped, strangled, and buried at High Island. Johnny DeLone, 16, also shot in the head. Billy Balch, Jr., 17. July 19th, Stephen Sickman, 17, bludgeoned with an unspecified object, cracking several ribs, and fatally strangled with a nylon cord, buried at High Island, misidentified in 1993 and correctly identified in 2011. August 21st, Roy Bunton, 19, shot twice in the head and buried in the boat shed, misidentified in 1973, then correctly identified in 2011. October 2nd, Wally Simino and Richard Hembry, both raped and strangled. Wally J. Simino, 14, buried in the boat shed. Richard Hembry, 13, also shot in the mouth, buried in an unknown location. November 12th, Richard Kepner, 19, raped, strangled, and buried at High Island, identified in 1983. 1973. February 1st, Joseph Lyles, 17, strangled and buried at Jefferson County Beach, found in 1983 and identified in 2009. June 4, William Ray Lawrence, 15, kept alive for three days, raped, strangled with a cord, and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. June 15, Raymond Blackburn, 20, strangled and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. July 7, Homer Garcia, 15, shot in the head and chest and left to die of exsanguination in Coral's bathtub, buried at Lake Sam Rayburn. July 12, John Sellers, 17, shot four times in the chest and buried at High Island Beach. July 19, Michael Balch, 15, Billy Balch's brother, raped, strangled, 
and buried at Lake Sam Rayburn, identified in 2010. July 25th, Marty Jones and Charles Koppel, both shot and buried in the boat shed. Marty Jones, 18. Charles Terry Koppel, 17. August 3rd, James Stanton Dremola, 13, raped, strangled, and buried in the boat shed. August 8th, the standoff at Carl's house. Timothy Cordell Curley, 19, attempted to rape and shoot, was rescued, died of an acute myocardial infarction years later. Rhonda Williams, 15, intended to rape and kill by proxy, was rescued. Elmer Wayne Henley, 17, his accomplice, intended to kill. Note, William Branch, Jr.'s father, William Branch, Sr., was a Houston police officer who died of a heart attack while searching for his son. As a result, he had been, at times, considered an indirect victim of Coral. Evidence of Other Victims A total of 44 boys were reported missing in Houston during the period of Coral's known activity. An isolated arm bone and pelvis were found in the same grave containing the 26th and 27th victims, who had been buried tied together. The search was abruptly terminated shortly after finding them, in spite of Henley's claim that Mark Scott and Joseph Lyles had not been found yet. Lyles' body was found by chance in 1983, and Scott's body has yet to be found. However, the bones have not been positively matched to Scott, and Henley denies that Scott was buried there, implying the existence of a 30th victim. Coral Candy Company employees saw Coral retrieving nylon cords and plastic rolls, which resembled those used to bury the bodies, from the factory as early as 1968. He also dug a lot in those years, supposedly to bury spoiled candy. Brooks declared that the two youths he saw when he ran into Coral and was bribed into silence were not James Glass and Danny Yates, Coral's first known instance of a double homicide. He also said that Coral had killed another victim before their first encounter, and that it happened at Coral's earlier residence before he moved into the house where Brooks and Henley brought victims to him. Coral, Henley, and Brooks were suspects in the January 17, 1973, disappearance of 16-year-old Norman Lamar Prater. Prater was last seen in Dallas, Texas, accompanied by a man and two teenagers with long hair. He lived in the same neighborhood as most of Coral's victims, went to the same high school as Henley between 1970 and 1971, and continued to visit Houston during weekends after he moved to Dallas. There are no known murders attributed to Coral between November 1972 and February 1973, but he is believed to have continued killing during that time. In March 1973, a couple announced seeing three men burying a suspiciously long, wrapped bundle in Galveston County. That same couple identified two of the men as Carl and Henley, and said that the third had long, blonde hair like Brooks. However, there are no known murders attributed to Carl between February and June 1973, and no bodies were searched in Galveston. Two other witnesses also claimed to have seen three suspicious men digging at the beach in May 1973, one of whom was later identified as Brooks. This sighting was not investigated by the Houston Police Department. An unrelated March 1975 investigation discovered a cache of pornographic pictures and films of 16 young boys in Houston. Eleven of these boys were identified as Carl's then-known victims, giving rise to the possibility that he was telling Henley the truth when he said that he was part of a slavery ring that bought and sold boys. Subsequent investigations resulted in the arrest of five individuals in Santa Clara, California. However, the Houston Police Department declined to investigate any links between them and Coral, arguing that Coral's victims' families had already suffered enough. According to Brooks, Coral told him once that his first victims had been buried in California. In February 2012, a filmmaker preparing a documentary about Henley found a partial Polaroid among the objects of Henley that his family had stored after his arrest in 1973. The image purportedly shows an unidentified boy in handcuffs, strapped to an unseen device on the ground, and next to Coral's toolbox. The boy has not been matched to any known victim of Coral and Henley claims to not know his identity. However, he has confirmed that he bought a Polaroid camera in 1972, the same year he met Coral. Notes Coral remained the most prolific known serial killer in the US until 1978, 
when Ted Bundy and John Wayne Gacy were both each attributed over 30 murders. Gacy reportedly admired Carl and was inspired to build his homemade rack after reading on the Houston mass murders. In 2012, allegations surfaced linking Gacy to a human trafficking ring, much like Carl had been rumored decades earlier. Henley is currently incarcerated at the Mark W. Michael Unit in Anderson County, Texas, while Brooks was incarcerated at the Ramsey Unit near Rosheron. He later died on May 28, 2020 from COVID-19, aged 65. Here we have come to the end of the video. I hope you have a happy life. Do not forget to subscribe to the channel and leave us your opinion in the comments. Thank you.